The, uh, the idea that analysis was a part of acting and performance is also a 20th century innovation. And the fundamental thing about this is that there were three movements that made uh, analysis come to life. They are, first, the, uh, the new science at the beginning of the late 19th and the very beginning of the 20th century, the new science of psychology. And uh, the French Theodore Ribot was very, pop, very famous for influencing the Russian director, Stanislavski, who created the Stanislavski system in Russia. Now, psychoanalysis was a style of psychology, and together, Stanislavski and psychoanalysis formed the second uh, movement, which was in America, method acting, created by the famous acting teacher, Lee Strasberg, who uh, years ago I had the opportunity to study with. Now, Lee Strasberg was not only influenced by the uh, uh, psychology and psychoanalysis, which was very much in vogue, but he was also influenced by the cinema, which was a very realistic approach uh, to psychological acting. And he wanted to then take the psychology of the cinema and the psychoanalysis, combine it in acting, so that on the stage everything would look very real. And they did this through analysis of character, which is the idea behind psychology. Once that happened, and analysis became part of acting, it suddenly became acceptable to study it academically on university campuses. And so now we had acting classes that focused on the psychological issues and used the Stanislavski system and method acting to teach in university theaters. And this is an example of what that might have looked like, the actors sort of sitting around a table doing rehearsals by analyzing their scripts. <clears throat> Iconicity is a very different kind of an approach. It's not really directed. There are what we call categories of imagery or strands of iconicity. And the imagery or the strands of iconicity have labels, events, dialogue, and interactions. And well, because of the time, I certainly can't go through everything. But I want you to note that the strands go like this. And while the actors are in the process of rehearsal, they explore and develop the imagery in the text, which is located with these strands, and it merges together, or it culminates in the act of performance. If you think of a whole person having a mind, thinking, a will, which is, pro propels them into action, and a personality, which gives them a face, it collects itself into the idea of the performance, which is then traded with the audience. And you can see that as the iconicity develops, the color of the, the, uh, the strands gets stronger and deeper, so that by the end of the process, the performance has all the imagery of the text. The play up here turns into a performance. You cannot understand the play until it's complete. This is one of the biases of iconicity. It suggests that a play cannot be understood outside the realm of its performance, which means that the idea of analysis is problematic because there's no way to understand what you're going to perform. The understanding comes in the moment of performance. And although an actor may have an understanding after performing it, it's not as clear and not as bright as when it's happening. But then you can't stop and ask the actor about it, so you just experience the play. I want to talk about the meaning of iconicity a little bit before proceeding, because it is the presence of imagery in texts. Not image, but imagery, which is the idea of an image. For example, in words, the flying eagle, you have verbal imagery. When you read that, you do get kind of a picture in your mind of a flying eagle. And that's what we mean by iconicity. There can be imagery in your mind, imagery in words. There can even be imagery in images, which is ideas in the image that you don't see. Here you can see the difference. This is an image. This is imagery. 
This is really mental imagery. And that's the difference. When we're doing iconicity, we're not making pictures. We're creating imagery. The first strand of iconicity is the most important one to begin the rehearsal process with, and that's called the strand of events. The strand of events is very simple. It's the learning of the story of the play. And we see that there are different kinds of events. The main kind of event, the indexical event, those point the way through the action of the play. We follow the index from the beginning to the end of the play. Symbolic imagery and iconic imagery are a little bit different. And we'll learn uh, about these things by looking a little bit more at the play, which we, we, uh, One Was Nude and One More Tales, as an example. In the play One Was Nude and One More Tales, the indexical character, now the indexical character is the character that carries the story of the play. If you don't know who the indexical character is, you can't tell the story. It's like not knowing who the, the hero is in a tragedy. You can't make it come true. So when the actors rehearse the imagery of the events, they figure out which character propels the story from beginning to end. And they do that by looking at what happens, the imagery of events in the play. The, in One Was Nude and One More Tales, the indexical character is the first street sweeper. Now, the symbolic character of the uh, second street sweeper in the beginning of the play makes a, uh, tells the first street sweeper how to live his life in a happy sort of spiritual way, maybe by doing yoga, and he gets this sort of very philosophical, strange idea from the second, second street sweeper about enlightened happiness. And during the course of the play, he meets this naked man in his bin who helps him understand in an active way the meaning of what the first street sweeper said, or the second st street sweeper said to him at the beginning. And through the course of the play, the first street sweeper understands this philosophy and changes his attitude towards life. And he meets different characters along the way, which we'll meet momentarily. As the play is performed, the indexical character comes to his understanding, and that understanding forms the moral of the parable. When he comes to that understanding of the moral at the end, and he expresses it, it's shared with the audience. And this shared experience is called catharsis. In other words, while the actor expresses it, the audience also feels a knowledge and an expression of it. The street sweeper, like I said, is the main indexical character. There's only one indexical character in every play. And sometimes they're hard to identify. Like Waiting for Godot, where the two characters seem very, very close. And yet if you look at the play carefully, you will discover that actually one is the indexical character and the other is a primary symbolic character. And this play is very, very clear that the first street sweeper is the indexical character. Now the audience needs to relate to the indexical character and they do this emotionally through empathy. If that's why acting, more than any other art, is an emotional art. It captures the audience's attention by sharing the same emotion with them. And that's the essence of empathy. The three symbolic characters of import in the play are obviously the second street cleaner who gives the first street cleaner the idea that he uh, charges through the play to understand the naked man in his bin who helps propel him to the understanding, and a kind of uh, sexy girl who brings out in the first uh, street sweeper his kind-heartedness. Now, this character also happens to be a prostitute, but that's not the main element of her character. The uh, interesting thing about symbolic characters is that they exist in order to reveal things about the indexical character that we otherwise wouldn't understand. 
In this case, the naked man reveals to the uh, street sweeper that the idea of spiritual clothing is inside. And all the, although the naked man is undressed, he still thinks of himself as a diplomat. But the uh, first street sweeper comes to understand the meaning of the spirit is an inner thing rather than an exterior clothing. The, uh, the uh, young woman, as I said, brings out the natural sort of goodness and uh, kindness that exists in the first street sweeper. And we wouldn't understand these things about him were the symbolic relationships not clear. There are also iconic characters, characters that we recognize simply by looking at them. In this case, the policeman is an uh, uh, icon, iconic character, and the flower seller is an iconic character, and this is where the tales come from in the story. The naked man uh, needs a set of tales to get home and talks the, he manipulates the first street sweeper into changing into this uh, tuxedo, taking him home, and then they change clothes. It's, it's all a big sort of farce. Now, oftentimes the iconic characters are in conflict with the symbolic characters. And so in the play, one was nude and one wears tails, you can see obvious conflict between the policeman and the woman in terms of their relationship to the first street sweeper. But the thing about the woman is that although she's a policeman and harassed, although she's a prostitute and harassed by a policeman for, for being a prostitute, uh, she can't exactly be just a prostitute because she has more depth than that. And if the actor were to play her as just a prostitute, she'd miss the point, and the audience would probably come out seeing her as a beetle nut girl instead, and they'd be completely distracted from the story of the play. So they, you have to find the right, just the right level of iconic persona to make it work. Even the street cleaner has iconic elements, but he's still the, uh, the index. Now, another important aspect of Dario Fo's plays are allusions to things. That's references to things that exist outside the play that the audience can still recognize. And in One Who Is Nude and One More Tales, there are three important allusions. The first of them is the play opens with a chorus of street cleaners. And this is an obvious allusion to the old Greek chorus, which shows us that the play you're about to see has moral significance, that it's not just a story or a drama, but you're going to learn something. And so it's very important that the chorus of street cleaners at the beginning delivers their choral uh, ode in such a way that you, it's, it's very clear that what's about to happen here is a moral tale. So here you can see a chorus of street cleaners and how they would resemble an old-time Greek chorus. Another important allusion in the play is to the Pope. And uh, the Pope, in this case, is used for the butt of uh, several jokes. And the idea, of course, is that Dario Fo is satirizing the formal church in order to bring about the idea that the true essence of Christianity, the, uh, the idea of spiritual happiness, and that the last shall be first, which is mentioned over and over in the play is the moral to come to that the person with the least will actually gain the, gain the most in eternity. And uh, this is, of course, a line in the play. Now, the last interesting uh, uh, allusion is to the emperor's new clothes. We have the naked man in the bin, and this uh, diplomat has come from an art exhibition thrown by the embassy called the Vernissage. So, he uh, has no clothes on in the bin, and here's a, obviously a cartoon of the emperor's new clothes, and in this the emperor is saying, I want to buy some modern art. And of course the joke is that the uh, modern art is somehow an illusion, it's really not art at all, it's either garbage or it's fake, and Jaroff Dorofo is making sort of fun of the upper, upper classes who go to a, a fancy art gallery thinking they know what real art is, they really probably have no taste at all. Uh, so, I'd just like to say that uh, when doing uh, iconicity, you come in contact with every element 
of the script through its imagery. And although I don't have a chance to go through everything with you, and in fact, trying to describe it in a lecture is probably not near as effective as if I had a couple of actors up here so we could demonstrate how to find imagery and then how to learn and develop how to perform it, it still gives you an idea of how it works from the very early point of discovering who's symbolic, who's indexical, and then you can find how uh, the imagery, the kinds of uh, imagery in dialogue, the kinds of imagery in the strand of interactions all come together to form a performance and catharsis. And well, I've also been able to show you who the indexical character is and the important parts of empathy. I've been able to describe for you the idea of symbolic characters and how they work in the uh, play. I've also been able to show you iconic characters and how they work in the play, and of course, the importance of illusions and how they work in the play. So you can kind of see them all sort of mapped out together in the strands of iconicity. I wish that I had more time. I've come to the end with the bell. And uh, I hope that the opportunity arises where we can do work physically together so that the idea and the process can come to life for you as an alternative to directing, which is now so much uh, part of the past. Uh, for those of you that are interested, you can get my book, Reinventing Drama, which is a complete statement of the whole process in detail, and that will, of course, clarify many, many uh, issues in the play. I just want to thank Joanna Cho, who worked so hard to translate all of these uh, strange uh, terms and if you have questions, she uh, will help answer some of them. Thank you so much. Thank you.